Part two, how to walk with Jesus through dark days. Uh, I can't tell you how important this segment of Revelation is because you all, the direction the world is going so rapidly, are going to come much sooner than, than a lot of generations of people where you have to make a choice about whether you're going to let people know you're a Christian or whether you're going to blend into the background. Because dark days are on the horizon. Public opinion is changing faster than ever in history. I mean, we can go from someone being famous to being vilified with one tweet, with one clip, with one headline, with one rumor. Can you imagine when the whole world thinks we're the problem, Christianity? So let's pray as we begin. Father in heaven, I pray that you would open our eyes to behold wonderful truths from your word. And that's what you promise, and that's what we ask. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Book of Revelation, God telling us how it's all going to end. This second walk through chapter 1 is learning to go through dark days. Now, first of all, let's talk about the principal interpretation. And uh, one or two of you came to me and said that you noticed that the slides you have in Canva don't match the ones I have here. Well, that's because I completely changed them for the New York students, completely. It almost, I lost the rest of my hair doing it. St Bonnie knows, my wonderful wife who's sitting there in the back table, uh, she knows I was up every night late, and I completely changed the slides and updated them and everything else. And so they have them in New York, and so I'm going to ask uh, the academic office here to contact the academic office there, and however Canva connects to put them in right for you but it would encourage them if you ask them how they're doing, uh, because it is a lot of work. It's quite a few gigabytes. Okay, how do we understand and interpret the Bible? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about how, how to know that the part of the Bible you're reading, the message is something you can apply to your life, and it's for you and not for someone else? Well, theologians have defined what are the canons. Those are the unchangeable principles of textual interpretation. And here's what they say. Correct interpretation is based on the historic, the geographic, the scriptural context. You've always heard context is king, you know, of everything. But when you combine that with the grammatical elements, that's the Greek or the Hebrew words and the tenses and everything, the positioning in the sentence, when you do that, you have proper interpretation. But there's one element we need to think about. The first rule of textual interpretation is, what did God mean when he spoke to the original recipients? See, you can do all kinds of historic, grammatical, and, and all kinds of geographic studies, but you mustn't get a message different than what God was saying in the first delivery of the message. That's, that's the most important of all the principles of interpreting the Bible. So let's, let's apply that as we jump back into Revelation 1. Now remember, here's the context of what God meant. God was looking at a group of people that were no longer, hardly any of them, eyewitnesses of his ministry. See, there were, other than John and a few others, there were few people alive in 90 AD that had actually been in Israel around the lifetime of Christ and, and saw all those things happen. So the second generation church, Jesus was looking at what they were doing with his revelation. Do you understand? Jesus knows how much of the scriptures you have and how much you've been taught and how much you've learned and what you're doing with it. And so Jesus, after the, the first generation, all the scriptures were written, deep into the second generation, Jesus actually visits and checks, unseen by the congregation, how they were doing. Well, how were they doing? Well, look at verse 9 of Revelation chapter 1. I'll get there with you. Revelation 1 and verse 9. Now again, we're back to my little journal. This is another one of my devotional thoughts. I've already titled each chapter like you have, and I'm finding all these truths, and the truth I'm finding here is John was at the worst time of his life. Now see what it says in verse 9? I, John, 
both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos. Why? Why are you on a high-security Roman prison island? Ah, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. He was keeping his flag up. I'm a Christian. Even when it was against public opinion and national politics, the emperor was opposed. In fact, for you all, I never got to do it for New York, but for you all, I'm hoping this week to find, uh, when Bonnie and I were, after we got done teaching uh, Paul's epistles in Greece, we got to teach Galatians and Romans in Rome, of all places. So I'm teaching a Bible class going through the book of Romans and the book of Galatians in the city of Rome in November, and whenever the, the classes weren't meeting, Bonnie and I would run out and visit more and more and more places from the Bible that were in the city of Rome. And so I would take my phone, and one day I went through the palace of the emperor that put John on Patmos. His name was Domitian. And that was one of the most amazing days I've ever had in Rome. And I, I gave a message to my students with my phone. I'm talking, and I'm going like this, and talking about Domitian's palace, and over there was Nero's palace, and over there was Caesar Augustus's palace, and I'm talking about it. And I'm going to find that because it's really fun to see the place where, all, where those emperors lived. But John was at the worst time. He had endured the horrors of the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, I asked one of you on break where you're from. You said Minnesota. If I'd have said what city you're from, you would have told me. Can you imagine armies coming, surrounding your city, and killing everybody in the city, massacring them, and leveling the city? That's what happened to John's beloved Jerusalem. And a million fellow Jews had been killed, and then the the empire had systematically hunted down all the fellow apostles. And now the very personal adversary to John was the Emperor Domitian himself. So John was hunted down, he was captured, he was exiled, and now he finds himself far from anyone he has loved and served and that could ever encourage him, except for one. You see, John was at the worst time in his life, and guess who was right there with him? Yeah. The one that loves him, the one that knew everything, the one that's all powerful, could have kept them from destroying Jerusalem, could have kept them from hunting down the apostles, could have kept them from being martyred. See, an omnipotent God could have stopped all that, but he didn't. An omniscient God knew it was coming, he could have deflected it, he didn't. A loving God, the Son, the Father and the Son, but I'm talking about Jesus, a loving God could have omnipotently and omnisciently stopped all this, but he didn't. But an omnipresent God was right with John. He wasn't alone. And so Jesus tells him, I know where you are. I know your address. In the whole Roman Empire, I know you're on that little speck called Patmos. And I want to reveal myself to you there so that you can write to a collection of churches that represent all believers alive in the first century in the church of Christ and all believers throughout all the centuries because this is written to God's servants in his church and throughout all time. So look at the next clue. This is the next thing I found. Look at verse 10. See how much fun it is to do this kind of devotional Bible study? You just make observations. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, so I wrote, we can stay full of the Holy Spirit even through the worst of times. That's just my observation from this verse. Because John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Wow. Yet here it is again, a Sunday. And wherever John finds himself, that is always the Lord's Day. And note, John is in the Spirit on that Sunday. And that's the key to serving God in the end of days. We have to stay full of the Spirit. We have to walk through life in Christ And we can live in the Spirit no matter what we're going through. Now, there's Patmos. I put a little red arrow pointing at it. And Jesus knew in the middle of this huge 
huge, unstoppable Roman Empire, John was a prisoner. And John only needed one thing, to be reminded. Let's look at his reminder. John was on the island of Patmos, a prisoner of the empire. That was my observation. He was imprisoned by the empire on this remote island, 10 miles long, 6 miles wide, off the coast of what we would call Turkey, exiled by Domitian. When Domitian died in 96, church history tells us, Eusebius, the father of church history, tells us that that Nerva, the following emperor, let all of the political prisoners of the previous regime's you know, prisoners go. And so John got out in 96. But look what John says. This is my fourth observation. John shared the same struggles as the faithful saints in the seven churches. Now, look at verse 9. Uh, for the word of Christ, or for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus, that's the end of verse 9, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I heard behind me a loud voice of the trumpet saying, I'm the Alpha, I'm the Omega, I'm the first, I'm the last. What you see, write in a book, send it to seven churches in Asia, which are Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. What the Lord is saying is, what you have struggled with, I want you to write all this to the other churches because you're not going through this alone. They're also in the epicenter. And look at that, they're not just in the epicenter. God knew, as he wrote Revelation, there were centuries. I mean, this, this is the one, Otho, Vespasian, there he is. There's the one that put John on Patmos. This is the one that taxed Jesus so he could go to Bethlehem. This is the one that was uh, watching over things when Jesus was growing up. This is the one that was sitting on the throne in the early church. This is the one that was sitting on the throne under Paul's ministry. And finally, this one, uh, Nero, took Paul and imprisoned him and killed him. There were centuries. I don't even have room on here to show you. Godless, immoral emperors who had absolute power. And that's what was down the road for the church. And God knew it because he's omniscient. So what did he do? Revelation was sent to guide believers through hard times. You know what's so neat? God knows exactly what's going on with you. He designed your DNA. He knows everything about your, your body. He knows when you're going to be sick. He knows when you're going to struggle with things, when you're going to have you know, accidents and disappointments and everything else. And he says, by the way, I already know about all those things, and I've prepared you for them. And you know what most people do? They wait until they're in the most desperate times, you know, when the wheels are falling off their life, then they jump into the Bible and God says, you know, it's much better if you know the guide about hard times ahead of time. So, so look back at verse 9. There's a word there that's important. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus. The word patience in verse 9, he's using the word for God telling us to hold on to Christ even when it hurts just to live. See, that, that word patience isn't just, you know, going like this and tapping your foot and waiting for someone in the line in front of you. It's the, the picture, if you ever watch a movie, they always, you know, zoom in on the face of whoever it is. You know, usually it's Tom Cruise, and he's hanging for dear life, you know, on, with one hand, you know, from a helicopter or once from a jet, you know. And that patience is, it's painful to even hold on. So think of something like that. That's what John's doing. He's holding on to Christ even when it hurts just to keep breathing. But think about his readers. But John's readers were going through the exact same thing. They were meeting in secret to avoid being fed to lions. They were suffering for their faith when they went to work. They were constantly surrounded with so much immorality that they faced temptation just walking down the street. Have you guys ever seen Greek statues? I mean, have you seen the statues of the discus thrower in the Olympics? Have you ever noticed the discus thrower and the one throwing the javelin and all the rest of them? Have you ever noticed one thing in common with all the Olympic statues from the first century? None of them have any clothes on. And, you know, most people go, well, you know, why don't they have any clothes on? Because all athletic uh, preparation was done in what's called a gymnasium. That's a Greek word. And we use it in English. Only we don't translate it. It's transliterated. 
The Greek word is gymnasium. The English word is gymnasium. Same thing. It's transliterated, not translated. What does gymnas mean? Naked. Sports were done nakedly. No clothes. Not spandex, nothing. That's how they did sports. That's why Paul, as he sat in Corinth, the leather shops were looking across the, the forum area of the ancient city of Corinth, and when he sat there, you would see people running around doing their activities, their sporting activities with no clothes on. That's where he wrote the book of Romans and talked about the decline and fall of the human race. Okay? How would you like to live in a culture where, where bathing could be done, men and women together, sports were done unclothed, Slaves regularly served food in banquets, not wearing any clothes. How would you like to live in that culture? Well, the Christians then didn't. They were constantly surrounded with so much immorality, they would face lethal. Did you hear Mark uh, Strout last two hours ago talking about temptation and all that? Uh, you know, he was talking about the flesh and all that. How would you like to walk out the front door of your house and just walking down the street seeing what we would call pornography? That's life in the first century. Let's go to the fifth lesson, and we'll pick that one up tomorrow. Look at Revelation 1, 11 to 20. It says, saying with a loud voice, you know, and I already read verse 11, and I turned to see the voice, verse 12, that spoke to me, and having turned, I saw. Now look at what I wrote in my journal. This is the only picture of Jesus in the whole Bible. Have you ever thought about that? A little bit we learn in Isaiah 53 where it says that, that his visage, his face was marred more than any man. But we don't really have a physical, we don't know if Jesus was tall or short. We don't know if he's wide or narrow. We don't know anything about him physically other than his lineage and everything. Now, we can read in verses 11 to 20 the only word picture describing God the Son, Jesus Christ, in seven elements. Look what we get. His hair, his eyes, his feet, his voice, his hands, his mouth, and back to his face. And all of these elements. Why seven? Because it's a complete picture of the risen Christ. Now I want you to think about that. And we're going to go through all the elements. But I want you to first back up and think about why, number five, do we get... Why did John get a picture of Jesus? Remember, John, John is on the island of Patmos, and John knew Jesus. He was one of the original disciples. He was the one closest to Jesus, remember? The one Jesus loved. Why did Jesus include this, this visible showing John himself again so John could describe him for everyone? Why? Well, I believe that Jesus was reminding John and us that the Christ of the Gospels is now unleashed. Now, think about what I mean. When Jesus walked out of the tomb on resurrection morning, I mean, I mean, we talk about, we just celebrated that. Think about what the disciples, what went through their mind when they saw the risen Christ. All of a sudden, they started thinking about three years with Jesus. Wherever Jesus went in the Gospels for three years, his very presence would make death flee, would make diseases fade, and despair would melt. Broken bodies that came into contact with Jesus were mended. Now, see, all this John saw in person, and what Jesus was reminding him is, that everything you saw me do back then, guess what? I'm the same. What does Hebrews 13.5 say? Jesus is the same what? Yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the same. And so he could repair a ruined life. He could repair sightless eyes. He restored them. He could fill empty ears with sound. He could take missing fingers and return them if the leper had lost their fingers. He could feed hungering lives until they were satisfied. Basically this, everywhere Jesus went, 
wherever he was and whenever he was there, his very presence meant that death and disease and despair were no more. But think about the implications. Jesus only did that from being in one place at a time. When you read the Gospels, it's, it's the most amazing thing to, to read that people would be over there and they'd hear Jesus was over there and they would sail across the lake to find him over there. And they'd go over there and find out he was up there in that corner. So they'd run around the Sea of Galilee to get to him. They were always trying to be where he was. Why? Because if you could reach through the crowd and grab his tassel, like Mark 5 says, And that woman that had suffered for her whole life with this disease was instantly cured. Or if you had your friend who never was able to get anywhere, if you could find Jesus in one place, you could tear through the roofing and lower your friend down in front of Jesus and Jesus could heal him. But only if you could be where Jesus was. But Jesus did all those things only being in one place at a time. That's why people were always chasing him around. Just Now think, the Gospels record 89 chapters of Jesus being in only one place at a time. But this is what Jesus is underlining for us in the book of Revelation. After Easter Sunday, after the empty tomb, the unlimited power of Christ now became available everywhere by anyone at any time. Jesus was no longer, what I like to say, is he wasn't localized anymore. He wasn't just bound to be in one spot of time. And after the resurrection, you find Jesus everywhere. I mean, he's walking down the road with two on the way to Emmaus, and he's walking through the door uh, to the upper room. And then they find him up on Mount Arbel, up and over Galilee. And he's available everywhere. The greatest source of peace and hope and joy imaginable, Jesus offered to John on the Isle of Patmos. Jesus Christ is always near us. He is always guarding us. He's always guiding us. He can always comfort us. And John just needs to be reminded of that. Now, this is what John noticed. Something changed. Jesus now was available to him on Patmos, And he was telling him he's available to those in Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and Thyatira. You understand? He's available in all of those places. He was available. The empty tomb on resurrection morning meant something had changed. It was Christ's availability. For three and a half years, anyone who could find him could have any need met, any fear removed, any oppression lifted, any chain broken, any defilement cleansed away, but only if you could find him. See, that's, that's what changed from the Gospels to now, after the resurrection. But let's just zero in. I've been talking about miracles and everything. Go back to verse 5, and I, I didn't talk very much about it, but I will now. From Jesus Christ, Revelation 1-5, the faithful witness, the firstborn over the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus is the one who offers the greatest miracle. Now, I know it's it's late and you haven't had lunch, but I want you to think for a second. There are 37 recorded miracles of Christ. Let's think about them. Jesus cured a leper. Okay, so this leper got fresh new skin like a baby's and couldn't believe it and everything worked, but in about 30 years or 40 years, the fingers stopped working as well, and after about 50 years, the skin was starting to sag and probably had a little sun damage. How about the one that was deaf? I mean, he could hear everything. The birds, he could hear the wind, he could hear everything, but 10, 20 years of loud noise around him, you know, at work and everything, and the ears started started dimming, and by the time he got to the end of his life, his kids were going, Grandpa! Dinner! Couldn't hear anymore very well. Did you know that's true of every one of Jesus' miracles? He raised people from the dead. They had to die again. He fed people. They were hungry the next day. 
He gave eyes to people. After a few decades, they dimmed. Not because his miracles were insufficient. Just because that's the nature of all of his miracles. All of his miracles diminished with time because of the fall and sin and everything else. But of those recorded amazing miracle after miracle during his time on earth, only one miracle stands out as the greatest, greater than all the rest. Though he healed and fed and calmed the storms and raised the dead, none of them compares to the greatest miracle. Jesus didn't come to impress people. He didn't come to feed the hungry or heal the lepers or manipulate the weather. Jesus came for one purpose, and that was to forgive. That's what all the miracles were about. That's what all the teaching was about. He said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. We're lost because of our sin, and there's only one cure for that sin, and I'm offering that. That was his greatest miracle is what I'm trying to tell you. The greatest miracle is still our greatest need. See, that's what's so amazing. There are still sick people. There are still hungry people. There are still people dying but we no longer, there are no longer healers and dead raisers, you know. There are no longer gifted miracle workers. God still works miracles, but those have passed away, the signed gifts. But the greatest miracle is still with us. Do you know what that is? That we can point people to the hope of forgiveness. I want to, for just a minute, challenge you with this, because we're supposed to be offering Christ's greatest miracle to our generation. Now, what I was doing... I think we have enough time for this. I was editing uh, one of my books. It's my dissertation, actually, at Dallas Theological Seminary. It's called Living Hope for the End of Days. It's a, a devotional study, the whole book of Revelation. And I, was, I had my Bible, and I had my manuscript, and I could hardly get anything done at the church because on my lunch hour, when I would sit in the lunchroom, people would stop by and ask me questions. And I couldn't read and I couldn't edit, so I decided, I told my secretary, I'm going to go eat lunch at Starbucks downtown where no one can find me so I can read and study for my lunch hour. So every day I went there, every day, same Starbucks. And by the way, it was a bad idea to go to Starbucks at lunch hour because the line would go out the door. They even had the turnstile, you know, you'd go like this and the line went out the door. But I would study in the line and I would stand in the line. You know how you can work and, and walk and everything. And, and every day I'd, I'd go to Starbucks... I'd make my order, and when I'd get to the end of the line, I would, you know, the barista would go like this, like you've all experienced, and he'd push it across, and he'd say, venti flat white, hand it to me. Well, I didn't pay much attention, you know, there's gazillions of people and everything, but finally one day, you know, after I'd been there several days, when he went like this, I looked into his eyes, and his eyes were about the color of our little... Ducky's beak, orange. Do you know what that means? He had hyperbilirubinemia. His liver was not functioning anymore, and his body was filling up with poisons, and when that happens, the whites of your eyes turn orange. So as my barista with the orange eyes slid my drink across, I looked up at his name tag, Daniel. And I made a deal with the Lord. I said, Lord, in my wallet, I always carry a gospel track. And what I always do is I take it and I, I pray over it and say, Lord, help, help, help me to have a divine appointment and help me to understand the one you want me to share this with. And I'll, I'll be faithful and be an evangelist and share that. And I put it in my wallet. I put it in my pocket. And I wait. Well, this guy... I could only reach him at the end of like 30 people. And I have a little rule. I won't witness to someone on company time because it makes the boss angry. It makes, it's just very bad to take someone earning $15 an hour and talk to them for 20 minutes about the Lord, you know. Somebody's losing money that's paying them. And so I said, Lord, um, this Starbucks has like 30 people in line always. If there's ever a time I come in and no one is in line, then I'll witness to him. How do you like that? That was the easy way to get out of feeling bad about witnessing to Daniel. And so I just went back and I was studying in line like normal. The next day, there were 30 people and I just kept studying until I got up to the counter and I said, uh, venti flat white, two thirds decaf. And I kept studying 
And I went, now I don't know if there were angels, you know, scaring everybody off, but for that moment, there was no one behind me at Starbucks at Utica Square. My heart started beating. I thought, wow. And so I just started walking toward the end, and Daniel goes like this and starts sliding it across. And I said, hello, Daniel. And his orange eyes got even wider that I knew his name. And I said, Daniel, I've been, I've been watching you for several weeks now. I come in here every day. And I said, I can see your eyes. I know that you're either on heavy-duty drugs or you're drinking your liver to death. I said, but you are going to die soon and wake up in what the Bible calls eternal destruction hell. Now, that's about 15 seconds. Now, I was talking to uh, Daniela uh, down here, and I told her that at one of my studies, I went through every time the Bible presents the gospel. And I found out that I've never found in the Bible anybody that presented the gospel the same way twice. So I thought, I'm going to be sharing it just for Daniel. And so I shared the gospel with him that way, basically handing him a track across the line as he passed me the, the Starbucks, and I said, this is a Bible study for you about how not to go to hell. I don't usually share the gospel that way. Well, let me tell you about Daniel. Daniel I'd watched for two weeks. Daniel was, uh, uh, back then they called him a goth. He wore everything black. Everything he wore was black. He had black everything, but he had piercings. He had piercings everywhere. He had them through tongue. He had them through cheeks. He had them, he, his whole ears were pierced with stuff. He wore chains. He had great big metal chains. They looked like big enough for bears. You know, They clinked when he walked. He had big spikes, metal spikes on his shoes sticking out. I mean, I don't know how you don't fall over when they catch each other. He had, he had little stud metal things down his pants on both sides, everything black, even kind of like an M&M black you know, um, snow cap on. That was Daniel with orange eyes. So, very noticeable. So I slid across the track to him. His big eyes looked at me. He just said, thanks. And that was it. And so I started praying. I always write down who I witnessed to, and I start praying, and I was going to follow up the next day. And so the next day, I prayed, and he was in my journal. Next day, I came to Starbucks at Utica Square, waited with through 25 people, and I got down to the end, and a young lady pushed my little Starbucks to me. I thought, huh. I looked at my watch. It was the same time he'd always been here. I thought, oh, this day off. For the next week, every day, no Daniel. So at the end of that week on Friday, I, when I ordered, I said, hey, where's Daniel? And the, the cashier looked at me and said, all of us are saying that. She says, did you know one week ago today, she said, at about this time, she says, Daniel just walked out the back door of the, rest of the Starbucks. He's never come back to work. He's never called back. We don't know what happened to him. We, we're worried about him. I said, well, I am too. You know, and I thought he, I actually walked around the back of Starbucks to see if he'd collapsed behind the dumpster or something because of his liver, and he wasn't there. And so I finished editing my book, a month went by, and I, you know, didn't come every day anymore. Six months later, I was working on editing something else, and I was back in my corner, you know, getting my drink, and I was sitting at my little table with my Bible. You know how you sit kind of facing the wall so no one bothers you? And I felt someone coming up, and I could hear clink, clink. I heard metal. I looked down, big black boots, metal. I could see chains. And I went like this. And looking me right in the eye, it was Daniel. He had the biggest smile. His eyes were big, wide, and white. And I looked at him, and I said, Daniel, he says, man, I've been looking for you everywhere. He said, you know, six months ago you came and, and, and you took that paper and you said you went like that and told me I was going to hell. He said, you actually scared the hell out of me. <laughs> and he said, you didn't explain it to me. And he said, so I left work. And he said, I took your paper. And he said, I walked down the street of the city. And everybody I met, I said, do you know what this means? Do you know what this means? Uh, this man left me and told me I wasn't going to heaven and I was going to hell. Do you know what this means? And he said, finally I went to a church that had a big sign that said guts. 
It was a weightlifter church. He said, and everybody in there looked just like me. I felt so comfortable. I walked into them and I said, you know what this means? They said, we do. And he said, we got down our knees and they led me to Christ. He said, I'm now the, he, his specialty was he was a heavy metal black, um, I don't know, heavy metal something drummer. And he said, I'm now the heavy metal drummer for this group that goes out from the church and they stop everything, put the spotlight on me and I tell the story of the guy that scared the hell out of me and and I give the gospel. He said, thanks for sharing the gospel. Hey, did you know he was the last person I would have normally have shared the gospel with because I didn't have anything I could relate to him except for one thing. The greatest need everyone has is for forgiveness. And that's the miracle God is still doing if we'll just share the gospel. Okay, real quickly, we only have 13 minutes. Here's the sixth lesson I found from chapter one. What does the picture of Jesus reveal to us? I actually wrote to me, but for you, I changed it to us. Here are the truths revealed about Jesus. Look about what he looks like. Look at verse 14. It says, His head and hair were white like wool. What's that? That spoke of his eternity. When you look at Revelation, you see that this is quoting from the book of Daniel. And it says that the Ancient of Days had white hair. So this is speaking of his eternity. He's the Ancient of Days. He has hair white as snow. And he wants us to worship him. And then, in verse 14, it continues. It says, his eyes were like a flame of fire. And that speaks of Jesus seeing everything. And, and he's inspecting our lives. He's, he's got like laser eyes that can see all. And then his feet, it says in verse 15, were like fine brass as if refined in the fire. And it, that speaks of Jesus as the ultimate judge. That's what the brass speaks of judgment. And he can crush all of our foes. Then it says his voice was like, well, verse, verse um, 15 says his voice was like the sound of many waters. And when Bonnie and I were on Patmos, I mean, you ought to hear those those Aegean Sea storms when you're on a little rocky island. And you can imagine John hearing that huge sound of the waves crashing. And Jesus has that all-powerful voice of God. And then in his hand, uh, he was holding the the messengers. He says, uh, and in fact, in verse 20, if you look at that, he explains it. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the messengers, the angelos of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands you saw are the seven churches. So his hand, he holds the messengers of his church. He's holding them. It shows his truth. He's guarding his compassion. He's holding them. Out of his mouth, it says, is like a sword. Uh, Jesus is the Word, the Creator, the Redeemer. There's so many elements you can study about that. Uh, It says he spoke all things into existence. And then his face. Um, It says uh, in verse 16, his, his countenance or his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And just that overpowering brightness. Jesus is the all powerful Lord of glory. So that's quite an introduction, but what's it? Why did he tell him that? Well, go back to verse 12, because this is the part we skip right over. Before all those big seven, I turned in verse 12 to see the voice that spoke to me, and having turned, I saw the seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, look at this, clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. Do you know what he just described? He described the outfit that's all the way through the Old Testament for the priests, especially the the one that has the the biggest outfit, the most elaborate, was the high priest. And we already know from the book of Hebrews that Jesus is the high priest, the great high priest. So what is he talking about? Well, I wrote, Jesus is actively coaching me right now and always. You say, where did you get that? Coach? We think of a coach as a guy in a suit coat screaming on the sidelines, you know? No, no. In the Old Testament, the high priest was the one that went around, and the priest in general, and were the health inspectors of the children of Israel. They inspected their food, whether it was clean or unclean. They inspected their houses, whether or not they were habitable. They inspected their skin. And Jesus shows up like one of these priests. And look what I, he's walking around among the candlesticks in the churches. Jesus now walks around among his churches looking at their lives and ministry. Why? So he can incinerate them with those eyes? No. 
That's what the Son of Man means. It means he understands us in our weakness. Jesus is seeking how to help us best reflect him as lights in the world. Now, this is what I wrote. I wrote, sometimes I go crazy in my journal and write a lot more than just one line. You don't have to go crazy in your journal. Just do the assignment. It's half your grade. Get your 10 titles, get your observations from 10 chapters, and write a prayer. Don't, by the way, it's pass or fail. If you do nine of them, you fail. If you do nine and a half of them, you fail, okay? The, the graders are looking for you to have 10 chapters, Revelation 10, title, lessons, prayer, okay? And you don't have to, you know, make pages and pages. I really want you just to have the enjoyment of, well, look, I wrote, your life coach is Jesus. Jesus knows right where John was. He knew right where every member of the seven churches were, not just physically, but even more spiritually. And Jesus, walking around in that high priest outfit, reveals he wants to help each of us all through life to be everything he made us to be. Isn't that amazing? Jesus designed each of us to reflect him and to do something no one else can do. I'm called to do something you're not called to do. And you're called to do something I could never do. We all are like spiritual snowflakes. We're uniquely gifted, designed, and called to do something no one else can do. And Jesus has a simple plan. Listen and repent. He says that to every church. It's the same ending in all seven letters. No matter where we are now on the spectrum of obedience, Jesus has his plan to get us right back on target. And, and what is that plan? It has to do with his favorite word for himself. When Jesus, look in verse 12, it says, or verse 13, one like the Son of Man. Whenever Jesus in the Gospels refers to himself, his most frequent self-identification is Son of Man. When John received the book of Revelation, he was living in exile. He was cut off from his family and friends. By this time in history, Paul was already beheaded. Peter was already crucified. John's own brother James was arrested and executed. And every other apostle was hunted down. John was the only one left. 11 of the 12 were already dead, and John was the target now. So Jesus is saying in verse 13, as the Son of Man, I relate with you. How do I say that? Well, it says in the book of Hebrews, he was in all points tempted like we are. It says in the book of Hebrews that we're supposed to come boldly to the throne of grace and mercy to find help in time of need. Jesus said, you don't realize how much I want to to feel your fears and your weaknesses and your pains. Jesus feels our struggles, and he wants to help us in every time. By the way, I, I, I told you, I, I read the Bible through regularly. Each time in my first about 50 times through the Bible, I look for one thing all the way through the Bible, the names of God, one month, all the prayers of the Bible, one month, every gospel presentation, one month, everything about prophecy, whole month, cover to cover, the whole Bible. When I studied through once, I looked at the emotions of God, you know, his anger and his, you know, wrath in the Old Testament. When I got to the Gospels, do you know what the most frequently mentioned emotion of Jesus is in the four Gospels? Compassion. Jesus, that's what he most of all is. He fe that means the word, Greek, is sum patheo, with to feel. Patheo is, you know, I, I feel, and sum means with. So I feel with you, Jesus said. So this is my prayer. I told you I'd give you an example. This is after the first chapter. After all those things I've shown you today, both hours, I wrote, Lord, I want to know and follow your plan. Help me to read and hear what you're saying and keep what you want me to keep. You loved me, you loosed me, and washed me. You are the Almighty, and Sunday is your day. And as you walk around your church, may you find me healthy. And use the sword of your word in my life to keep me useful and pure. For Jesus' sake, amen. So that's an example. I just showed you finding principles you already have titled and there's a simple prayer that wove in some of the lessons that I found. 
Now, before we go this morning, until they get the uh, slides on, you can get them on YouTube, okay? If you pop that QR code with the little dinosaur in the middle, you go right to where they are. And it's, it's the channel where everything I've ever, do you know, I love the question and answer sessions. They don't do those here. But in many places where I am, I'll be in a room with, you know, however many people with a whiteboard, and they just, they just stand at the microphones and ask questions. Where in the Bible say this? Why does it say that? Why is that? Those are all recorded on there. I teach biblical counseling and discipleship, and, and there's a whole two-year course on there. I love teaching prophecy and, and all the books of the Bible, but they're all right there. And that's because the book of Revelation is how it all ends. And the second lesson is, how do we walk with Jesus through the dark days? We walk through knowing he's walking with us, knowing he's watching us and doesn't miss anything, but knowing that he is the son of man and he was in all points, Hebrews 2 says, tempted like we are, yet without sin. And he says, I want you to flee to me to find help in time of need.